It's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome our own Matt Hogenkamp, who will tell us about the nilpotent cone for SL2 and annular links. Annular yeah, link homology. Link, yeah, I'm sorry, annular, annular link homology. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, for the uh, invitation to be here. Um, so, yeah, so um, I want to talk about some kind of recent work. Um, so just for a little bit of context, uh, so there's a, a couple of things I could say for context. So Dave Rose uh, and Paul Vedder and I were thinking about annular um, uh, link homology. We wanted to have some description of um, this something called the skein lasagna module or associated to a four manifold. Um, and so we studied this, this category that appears in annular link invariance called the dot temper the leap category. And uh, we're sort of pointed towards the direction of nilpotent cones by Lev Rosansky. Um, and so what I talk about today will be basically the uh, some stuff that we figured out about how to link link homology with nilpotent cones. Um, but I should probably mention Lev because um, being kind of influential and pointing us in this direction. Okay, but so I want to um okay so let's just so we'll be talking about the group uh so we, see the nil potent cone is the uh variety of no potent matrices two by two matrices of trace zero So being trace zero and nil potent means that your characters are polynomial. Well, anyway, uh, being nil potent means that your characters polynomial is just uh, <clears throat> t to the n. <laughs> and in the case of two by two matrices, uh, that would have gone to just be having determinant zero and trace zero. You know, um, there is a group acting on this variety, namely not only SL2, which acts by conjugation, but CSR, which acts by rescaling. So, specific, I'll say if uh, G is an element of SL2, big SL2, and Z is an element of CSR, then the acting on a nil potent matrix would be conjugation times Z to the negative two for every. Okay. Um, let me just tell you some extremely elementary things about the nil potent cone before I sort of say the main goals of the talk, and we'll go from there. Um, so functions on the little wooden cone, I'll denote it in this way. So this is what? This is a polynomial ring in the coordinates A, B, and C. Modulo the relation A squared plus B squared equals zero. The C star action on the variety, we'll think of as just endowing this ring with a grading. And because of the way the z to the negative two means uh, they, these guys are going to have degree two. Place these guys have degree two and make that a greater degree. So the grading somehow tells us the CSR action on functions on N. The SL2 action um, will act, you know, the SL2 action can mix with the CSR action, so it's going to act in a gradient preserving way. So we have monomials, we have the sort of empty monomial, the linear monomials, the, well, I don't want to write A squared because A squared is negative BC, but we have uh, a, B, A, C, B squared, B, C, C squared, and so on. The SL2 action, so there's a one dimension space of uh, constant polynomials, three dimensional space of linear polynomials, five dimensional space of quadratics, seven dimensional space of cubics, and so on. 
And these representations are just you know, the representation of SL2, so I can label them by their highest weight. This is the trivial representation, this is the and so all of these are just the uh, irreducible representations of SL2 with even highest weight. Um, Okay, so that's the very explicit way of thinking about functions on the number one column. Uh, my goals. That's not. So first off, I want to describe a diagrammatic presentation of this. Yeah, I'm like going going here. Sheaves are really vector bundles on the number one column. This is something that. I think it's kind of cute and new. We we didn't know about this. Uh, we certainly didn't know about this before. Recently, so I'm going to denote by bond G. Uh, the, the, this is equally to my notation for G equivariant, you know, vector bundles. G where G is G is this group. SL2, but also C So this is going to be my notation for G equivariant vector bundles binary. And, and I want to give a diagrammatic description of this category uh, in terms of what are called data tempered lead diagrams. Goal two. Is going to be, uh, we're going to describe an assignment. So, this is um, not really, in essence, due to us at all. This is really just a, a sort of standard construction uh, due to build, building off the work of Kavanov and Ruth uh, V. Berry. There's a construction that will produce from a link diagram in the annulus or I'll just say a link given a link in the thickened annulus will produce a complex of you know G of a variant vector bundles. Uh, and goal three, which I always run out of time, so who knows if I'll actually get here. But the goal three would be the uh, so this allows us to describe vector bundles or complexes of such things uh, in a more kind of like a kind of cute topological way. And one application of this is we get pretty pictures for uh, some. So there's something like a highest weight structure. Actually, there is literally a highest weight structure on. The category of like coherent sheaves on you know geodirect coherent sheaves on n or some abelian subcategory of that. Um, and the standard and co-standard objects. Um, so go three. So, um, so there's some special annular links which are just you take. So this is going to be a, an example of a link diagram drawn in the annulus. The X uh, indicates the sort of central puncture of the of the annulus, and then the outer boundary of the annulus is the current script at infinity. So anyway, so this is a link diagram. You're supposed to think of it as representing a link in the thickened annulus. And the chain complex that we associate to it, I'll indicate the chain complex by writing brackets. Um, the chain complex that we associate to this will be uh, equivalent to this like co-standard object in this highest weight structure. This is the best problem. This is, as far as I know, this is in SL2, maybe these things were constructed before this, but Bezer Company Club constructed these kinds of things for a general uh, symbol the objects. So you call these um, 
I'll just call them desert cosmic knots, those standard objects. And if these are co-standards, the standards will be just you switch the crossings and do the same thing. So the relationship between these complexes is very much mirrors like the kind of relationship between a Berman and Oberman category. That's a little summary. Okay. Was there a question down here? Yes, yeah, nice. Okay. Uh, I just have a question. So, you know, start a few questions, start the kind of back bottom. What about coherent sheets? Coherent sheets? Yeah, coherent sheets. Is that simpler already done? Huh? Is that harder, simpler already done? Well, coherent sheet, I mean, you should think of a coherent sheet as being resolved by vector bundles. And so, it's, this this is a category of like DV code. This this is this will be a presentation of DV code, is my thinking thought. Yeah, but I'll say add it for as long as possible to work with vector bundles. So, so, but if you don't put into complexes, then it's just they're different categories, right? Um, yes. Uh, and I won't be describing that category. I mean, oh, you'll, 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 you'll see how they're related. So, uh, like vector bundles should be thought as projective modules over here. Yeah. Huh? And I mean, it should be. Not too complicated, but I don't want to go into it. How to describe the coherent okay. things in general, but yeah. See, when you were standards and cross standards, they are indexed by integers. They'll be indexed by non-negative integers. So here, I'm sorry. The understanding is that you that's the number of that's the number of strands you hit on the way from the puncture to infinity. So it's it's the number of crossings plus one. And is this a tensor category? Is, uh, is, uh, in fact, it is. It is. In fact, it is, yeah. The category of vector bundles. Because, well, you'll see, I'm going to describe this category. Um, and explicitly. Mm -hmm. oh. So to to Valeria's point, um okay, so uh and let me just say this, but maybe not um write it down. You could in principle, so the reason why I'm not I don't think this is like a killer app or with her necessarily. Like I think you could probably deduce this from Work of Kaudis Kandenser plus geometric Sasaki. I don't know. The Kaudis and Kandenser also have kind of a geometric, I mean, they're like uh, very early in the game. They, they were the ones who constructed like a geometric category, like a geometric construction of some link multi theories. But they took values in like perverse sheaves and some affine Grassmannian, or affine flex, anyway, affine Grassmannians. So presumably these are the same as what they do, but just related by some size of consistency, which I don't want to go into. If you know what those words mean, then you can probably figure this out. But I am a fan of very explicit down to earth construction, which is what I'm going to give you today. Okay, so fact, um, so coherent sheets, and which are you know, geo grains, I should think of these as being, so this is affine, so, uh, so she's coherent she are the same thing as finitely generated modules over this for this ring. Um uh, maybe I should write ah but, yeah. um no no sorry, sorry, this is fine. Uh uh, but because we have G equivariants, these are gonna be module objects in the category of G representation. So being an equivariant chief means that you're just a module over this ring of functions, but regarded as an object of this category. So you're a G rep with an acting of this thing in a way it's compatible with the sort of way it tends to G rep together. Um, and that's the same. We're going to identify this with just graded. 
the C star action is always just going to be some sort of grading. This is going to be graded in residuals in just add cell two. So this has an explicit description in terms of temporary lead diagrammatics. Uh, and this has an explicit description as just the direct sum of representations. V2K, the algebra structure is just given by, well, there's a unique map of the scalar from the sense of product of two of these guys into And the multiplication is just inherited from the only map you can write down. Um, this guy. Uh, and then and then bundles, vector bundles, you have to vector bundles to be thought of as projectives in this. Uh, and in the end, what you find, so these are just going to be sums and shifts, sums of shifts of some ends of direct some ends of. So basically. Uh, I want to think of this category as being just the additive, I have complete, graded, whatever category generated by objects of the form. I can just take uh, any SL2 representation and censor it with this SL2 representation and then regard that as a module over this thing. So these are like what my free modules are. They're just a representation of SL2 tensor with my ring. Okay. And maybe one more thing just to get us, you know, get the, our brains in the right place. I just want to note if you have two such objects in this form, and you calculate the house space between them in this category of G or whatever, like ever effective bundles. Got the room, so I want to save, I want to calculate the house space from this thing to some, some other guy of the same form. Well, by like usual tensor hum and junction nonsense, I can forget about the action. I can forget about this factor and forget about the sort of module structure of this thing. So I just get the same, this is the same thing as just hums in the category of SL2 representations between M1 and this tensor product. But then that's just the direct sum. Okay, so if I want to understand this this guy as a category, um, I will need to know what home spaces look like, and this is what they look like. Okay. Is cool? At this point, if you know what the temporary leap category looks like, you can guess what I'm going to write down. You don't even need to like, it's like go to your desk and work out the details. So I want a category. Um, Whose objects are parameter? Who, who's up? Okay, sorry. So, what do I want to say about this? I want to say that the category of G equivariant vector bundles on for the N is like a graded deformation of just SL2 rec. Meaning the HOM spaces in this category are Z, are Z, are Z graded. And if I look at only degree zero morphisms, then I recover just SL2 rec. Yeah. Okay, so I want to start with the category SL2 rec and then just sort of add morphisms until I get this thing. That's it. Okay. <laughs> now for some pretty pictures, is that's not how I think about things. Hmm. So I'm going to define a, a diagrammatic category. 
which knows about SLT representations. So, so let's uh, we'll talk about the temper the deep category. Uh, this is really the temper the deep category at three equals negative one. Um, what is it? It's the category whose objects are just parameterized by natural numbers. And whose morphisms, well, if I want to talk about the homs in TL, if I want to talk about homs from N to M in this category, uh, it's objects in the category, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, I'll work everywhere with complex coefficients. So I take the C vector space. Sort of uh, formally spanned by diagrams drawn in a rectangle. With N points on the bottom, M points on the top. And the kinds of diagrams that are allowed in the, in the rectangle are really just any kinds of diagrams. I, I can have crossings. Um, I don't want these to be like braided pictures. I just want them to be like stringy diagrams. Possibly even with some little circles in the middle. Okay. I take the C linear combinations of those things and I mod out by some relations. Uh, the relations I want to mod out by are okay. Relations like this are hard to write down because a little circle looks like a lot like the number zero. Okay. I don't mean the number zero is negative two. I mean the little closed, the little trivial loop. These aren't oriented oh. strands. Huh? They're, these aren't oriented strands. They're not oriented, yeah. yeah. Actually, the, the fact that I um, can get away with without orientations is related to the fact that this has to be negative. Okay. Yeah, there's an oriented version of the story where this is positive to that's another uh, other relations we impose the crossing can be written in terms of non crossing things. I also want to mod out by what's called regular homotopy. So I allow moves like this. So these are these are like the braid relations or whatever, like the symmetric group relations. Um, but these are called regular homotopies. Uh, this relation. It, so how, how I am supposed to simplify this sort of thing is actually determined by these two rules. Um, so this one, undoing a little kink like this actually introduces a negative sign. Um, so just you've been warned that uh, it's not, undoing the kink is not free. There's a slight penalty. Um, and that's it. Okay, so these are the relations. So this is the temperature of the category. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, the other way, yeah. Um, there's a left, right, top down symmetry on everything. So the other key. The left, right, right. Hmm. This is the template. That's where you release that palm there. So, <laughs> yeah. so endomorphisms. Type so you just fix m1 to be equal to m2. Yes, uh, you can identify this with jack pole means, but right? Yeah, this yeah, is not a solely treat when yeah, we're talking about this. Yeah, thing. like, do you see anything? I don't know, the don't... symmetric function theory and like the endomorphism. Yeah, I mean, everything is related. Yeah. Well, it's kind of weird because yeah. you're you're it's like you fix one jack pole no way, but then you know, you let that jack parameter like the k is the jack parameter, so it's like the same one, but. All the different parameters. I don't yeah, really know what if they I do. understood the jack one was sort of better. I think I could give you, I could probably give you a better answer. Right, right now, all I can say is um, everything is the same as everything else. Okay. You know, there's like half line, there's half line heck and algorithms everywhere, and half line just, I mean, K0 of this category is like the half line heck algebra for SLT. That's, that's also, I mean, you know, kind of. Okay. Sorry. 
Let's talk later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I won't erase, really uh, erase this for now because we'll come back to this a couple of times. Okay, so the theorem, and I don't, it's so old, I don't even know who to attribute this to. Maybe a very easy consequence of survival duality, so I'll make it right, sure and vile. I mean, this is like a special case of survival duality, basically. Uh, is that there is a functor? Not only there exists a functor, but you know, you can write it down explicitly from TL to SLT rep. And what it will do is send the object n to the SL2 representation, which is v to the tensor power n. So v is, from this point on is going to be my notation for the, the standard representation. And morphisms like this. Well, that's supposed to be a morphism from the trivial representation to v squared. And well, v, uh, so this guy, I can write it as the span of, you know, uh, lowest weight vector and the highest weight vector. I won't write down all the formulas, but like, for example, this one sends one to the kind of natural invariant vector inside here. There's a choice. You have to make a, cho a sign choice. Um, in one possibility. <sighs> so that's where you send the little cup, where you send the cap. You can write down from this. I mean, so it'll take me all day to write down all theory from like, but um, this, this should be correspond to some morphism from V squared to the trivial representation. And because it's hitting the trivial representation, uh, these guys should go to numbers. I think this one's the negative one. And this one is positive one. Again, there's like a sign choice. One of choice of these signs determines the other. Um, and then the plus plus goes to zero and minus minus goes to zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. And furthermore, this functor is not just uh, any old functor, it's fully fixable. So it, um, so Hom spaces in SL2 representations are the same as Hom spaces in group L. But it's not quite um, surjective. Like there's some objects here that are just not of this form. So it becomes essentially surjective after throwing in images of eigenvalues. So it's an equivalence of categories. It's maybe you should call it a Maria equivalence of categories. It's an equivalence. Of, it's a functor which becomes an equivalence of categories after adjoining your XM and your XM. So uh, it's these little direct sum ends that I want to so discuss now. The taking the Kirby envelope. The added, yeah, the, the additive envelope of the Kirby envelope. So, um, so for instance, recall that this object of SL2 rep is really the symmetric power. So to describe this object, I need to I need to describe what is the symmetrizing that would look like and then sort of adjoin its image with the formal object of TL. So let's talk about uh, symmetrizers for a second. So we'll have diagrammatic language for them because they're going to appear quite a bit. So we'll let PN denote the symmetrizing that impotence. In terms of diagrams, I will just indicate PN by writing a box, an empty box with N strands. This is our diagrammatic notation. And what it really is, is it's the sum over all permutations. You just take the string diagram for that permutation. You would ask a morphism in TL, and I 
sort of obvious way, and then you normalize with the nine buttons. I have to erase this. So the properties enjoy, uh, enjoyed by these things. So uh, these these are called the, the symmetrizers. Uh, obviously, okay, sorry, this is very elementary, but I got, I mean, okay. So uh, these, these projectors kill turnbacks. Meaning identities like this. So all possible relations of this form, including from cups from below, turn backs from below. Um, projectors, uh, big projectors absorb small projectors. So any picture of this sort will be equal to a picture of this sort. Basically saying if you symmetrize all n strands and then symmetrize with only a couple of them, well, the last step is completely irrelevant. You're already symmetric in, the, in a smaller group of strands if you're if you're, if you're in the full strand. Whatever. Uh, I Okay. Okay, and so now we can introduce our our graphical calculus. Okay. So I'm going to do something very similar. Um, remember the, the morphisms. We should think of vector bundles, GF covariant vector bundles on the null cone, as being some like Z graded deformation of this. Category of SL2 representations. So, what I want to do is I want to tell you how to join morphisms to this category of degree two and higher. And what, you know, what relations. So, I'll define a category that I'll call DTL. Also, this is the Q equals negative one version of the story. Uh, and, and, I, and I didn't write this because I better write anything sometimes. Sorry. sorry. This is not just a functor, it's a monoidal functor. There's a monoidal structure on TL which just places diagrams side by side. So this is going to be monoidal in the same way. So I'll say it's monoidal, and the hump faces are going to be Z graded. Objects are going to be the same as before. The morphisms are going to be the same as in TL. Uh, and then we adjoin dots. So we allow our strands to carry a dot. The dot is going to have degree two. Uh, ordinary temporal leading diagrams are going to have degree zero. And then I mod off by some relations. So I mod off by whatever relations I already have in CL. Um, and I want dots to slide past crossings. Why wouldn't I? That's a natural thing. Um, I want a dotted circle to be zero. I want what else do I want? I want two dots in the in in strand to be zero. And that's it. Let me just say, sort of as a remark, that remember the crossing it was there, there was a relation that told us how to expand the crossing in terms of diagrams without crossings. And so uh, oh sorry, there's there's one more relation. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'll write it in a second. So expanding this crossing 
in terms of things without crossing gives me this. Expanding this crossing in terms of diagrams without crossing gives me this. And so there's a there's a another way of writing this relation, which is the difference of these two guys equals the difference of of these two guys. But notice there's kind of an asymmetry now. So what I told Eva about there being a symmetry on TL, the left, right, up, down symmetry, um, uh, is actually no, it is broken now because I can tell the difference between left and right somehow. Like if I took this this relation and rotate it by, by 180 degrees, I would get, uh, well, sorry, what do I want to say? I want to say that there's now sign that you have to be careful with. And one kind of consequence of that is actually a funny relation of this sort. The 180 degree rotation of a dot is in fact the negative of the dot. So when I draw dots, I, I, I need to be careful on which side of my humps I draw them on. And now I want to uh, puncture. I want, oh, I have to cover this up for a second. So, theorem. There is a functor from. So, this is the those better. Yes? Maybe this is going to be answered by the theorem, but I was wondering, so you described the cat with it. Can, can you describe some of the intuition of the reason to why you want to put a dot and not three dots? Or, or I, I think that's going to come out yes, of the functor. Because the functor has to exist. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. So you guessed it from that because because you wanted that with this story. Or maybe okay. So historically, what happened, I'm giving you a very a historical picture right now. Historically, what happened was this. So there, there is this construction of linked homology, quantum homology. Um, you can define quantum homology for links not just in R3, but for links in any thickened surface. So like you could take the annulus across an interval with the links in there. Um, but then the question is, in what category does your link invariant take values? So the category which receives, you know, like Kavana type invariance of the annular links is called the annular Barnesson category. And this was something that was given a diagrammatic description by Heather Russell. So the data temper of these categories originally appeared, as far as I know, in the context of annular Kavana homology. And there are other representation theoretic reasons. Um, or why you would also expect the nil cone to appear. And so if if some you know smart person like a Blumka or Rosansky tells you that the nil cone should appear, and then you also know that the data temper the leaf category appears because you nice calculated it. Okay. The question is how are they related? And the answer is they're the same. Okay. Uh, so there is a functor from the dotted temper to the category to this enhancement of SL2 graph, which sends again the object N to just the. I'm going to get very uh, tired of writing tensor TN all the time. So I'm just going to write a tilde. To, to denote when I want to regard my object uh, in, in this as a vector bundle in the fucking con. So this is this is going to be some quick short time. I've already told you what happens to uh, the temper of the lead diagrams. You just uh, temper the lead, an ordinary temper of the lead diagram gives me a morphism between SL2 representations. I can just take the identity on this factor and it gives me that piece of a functor. Now I just need to tell you what the dot does. So if I have a dot, 
uh, let's say I have, you know, the object n and I'm putting a dot on the height strand or something. So the morphism that I do, uh, that I send this to, is okay. This is this is my my pretty picture. So what does this mean? Uh, this I'm supposed to think of. So the the square box is my little symmetrizing item for these. And so, because because of how it's drawn, so you should think of this as a copy of v to the tensor power n, and you should should think of this as a copy of v to the tensor power n. But then, with this extra factor of uh, v lower two, so this is a symmetrizing. I've taken a morphism and I follow it up with a little partial symmetrizer, which means I I I, I can. Regard this as a morphism into the second symmetric power. Okay, so this is a morphism in just kind of two rep from v to the power n to v to the power n kind of tensored with v lower two. But then I'm regarding this as a degree two sub piece of moms in the larger category. So it's, it's the degree two part of this morphism space. That's my function. Okay. Uh, hmm? It's awesome, yeah? I don't know. I was really happy. And the relations that we have, so I, there's the functor, and we can check the various relations now. So let's um, let's do a couple of these relations now. I'm going to wrap, I mean, if you haven't seen these figures before, I think this is a really great, I mean, I think this is a really great exercise. Where does that sign come from, for instance? Um, so uh, let's, let's check this one. The dot squared is zero. So I have not told you, well, I maybe imply, but didn't really say explicitly how you're supposed to compose morphisms. And the way you're supposed to compose morphisms is if I have like a morphism from Vn to, let's just say I want to compose n of morphisms of Vn tilde. So I have a map from Vn to Vn, but but with this like extra little synthesizing thing coming out of the top. If I have another such diagram and I want to compose it with the first one, I have to move this one out of the way. And then I stack pictures. So composition is always going to be stacking pictures. So composition is I do this composition of diagram. I just like stack this diagram on top of that one. But then I then I symmetrize, I do a full symmetrizer on these strands. But, because, but by projector absorption. I don't have to explicitly include those little white boxes anymore when I do this composition because the symmetrizing here and there is already to be kind of big. So this is what composition of morphism is going to look like. Um, okay, so let's say I take two dots uh, squared. Sorry, sorry, I, I take the dot squared. Um, I need to verify that this gets sent to zero under my functor. So let's just do it. So the first dot is that morphism. The second dot is, and I push this guy out of the way for a moment, and then I do the same thing. I do the same thing as before. Remember, every single one of these little crossings is supposed to be interpreted as a is a linear combination of you know the. It's resolutions. Since it eats the kills the turn back. Yeah. yeah. And this is zero Y. Well, by projector absorption or whatever, I can erase these boxes. And then there's a regular homotopy that tells me I can I can this, this is a turn back, which gives me zero. Cool. Yeah. 
out. Square root is zero. How about that? Sorry. Uh, what was the turn back? This this uh, strand is going to, after a little homotopy, is going to give me a turn back on the symmetry, which is zero. And it's the same statement in fully faithful monoidal. Um, the same thing as before. It's a fully faithful monoidal functor, which becomes a section which is which is which is surjective on objects after you throw in gradient shifts. Because don't forget we have the CSR action this time. You throw in gradient shifts and direct sums and direct sum ends. Okay. So the uh, the map here is coming along the but about what the dot gets back to. Yes. I'm trying to imagine this is a. I mean, this is supposed to be what what on is it? Right. It takes so in your picture. It, I feel confused about how to like what does it do? Like which which on is it between these products? I feel yeah. I'm not sure what. Oh, which like, like, is it? It's kind of, what's confusing me is that you've yeah. got some like, strand coming from the top and from the bottom. And I guess I imagine the top is like the target space and the bottom is the source. Uh huh. So, what is it? I mean, let's just think about for a second uh, if the dot was on the far right. So, we don't have to worry about these extra little strands. If the dot was on the far right, then the formula is. You do the identity on a bunch of factors, yeah. and then this thing. And what is this piece of the diagram? That's the there's a canonical morphism from V1 to V1 and to V3. Because uh, in the Clutch Gordon rule or whatever for identifying tensor products of irreducibles as they are some of irreducibles, we get V1, there are some V3. And there's a there's a canonical map that includes V1 as a sum in. And that's what this is. Okay. So um there's a lot of things one can say about this, but I want to get to the uh, in my couple minutes. Um, are there any other questions about this like diagrammatic presentation? Um, okay, I'll leave these relations up here on the backboard. Um, and so now there are a bait and switch is going to occur. Um, I will, from this point on, completely forget about the category of vector bundles on the nilpotent cone N, and I'll just view it using this equivalence this with the diagrammatic category. So when I build my chain complex for a leaf diagram, I will build a chain complex of objects in DZL. And then you're supposed to believe that that is really a complex of vector bundles by this equivalence. <clears throat> so if you have never seen the Kavana construction before, this is going to be way too fast um, to really digest. So I, I want to um, really just work through one example. And uh, here's what we're going to do. So, so this is uh, part two. So from lead diagrams and the inlets. So I'll draw my diagrams in, in S1. Press the interval. Uh, I'm telling you how to build a chain complex in 
So it'll be a, a, a bounded chain complex but of objects in DTL. And I will allow myself to take formal direct sums in gradient shifts of objects. So here, uh, so this is the additive Ruby envelope. So throw in direct sum ends, throw in direct sums, throw in gradient shifts. I'll use the notate, I'll use uh, some shorthand. If M is a graded vector space, And if X is an object of DTL, then M tensor X is going to denote the direct sum of shifted copies of X. Where the shifts and the indexing set they just given by writing on a, like a hundred unit spaces of M. Um, I'll denote a shift of X by the letter Q. So this, these are going to be shifts of X. So you should think that, like Q to the K. What that means is I'm I shift in such a way that the number one lives in degree K. What this equation means. So, um, so here's the procedure. So we're going to start with a link diagram. This is going to be our running, our kind of example. It's basic link diagram drawn in an annulus. So I'll just regard the annulus as being the puncture plane, and the little x here denotes my puncture. Uh, so each crossing has a, a pair of resolutions we can assign to it. I'll call this the zero resolution and I'll call this the negative one resolution. The reason being that in the end, I want to build a chain complex and these terms are going to contribute negative one to the cohomological degree. These ones are going to contribute zero to the cohomological degree. And um, notice also there's a there's a relationship between this smoothing and this smoothing. Namely, there's a saddle coercion. Um, some of us are teaching Cal three, so we're very good at drawing saddle coercions now. So what I'm going to do uh, to build my chain complex is I'm going to first resolve each crossing um, into kind of an interval's worth of stuff. So I have two crossings. Which means I'm going to have two, a two by two square of resolutions. So I can resolve both with a negative one resolution, or I can resolve one with a zero resolution and the other a negative one resolution, or I can resolve them both with the zero resolution. Okay. And then the rest of the picture. What's the reason why one is, is negative one and the other is zero? You're worried about the asymmetry? Or, 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 I don't know if I'm worried about it. I just, well, it's really just a choice of convention. There's no, okay. there's no reason. Okay. Um, I just want my complexes um, to be supported in degrees like less than or equal to zero. Okay. For some strange reason. Yes, I do. So you, you take all four of these resolutions. Now I'm going to color the circles in each resolution. So each resolution now is a collection of circles. And I'm going to color a circle blue if it is inessential. Inessential means does not encircle the puncture. So that circle is inessential. This one is inessential. Uh, this one, if you think about it, is just one circle and it's not inessential. So maybe an essential circle, it will be colored green if you can see that. Mm 
And you guys see that that actually encircles the puncture once. This encircles the puncture once as well. This one encircles the puncture. And then all three of these encircle the puncture. So now I have these diagrams um, and each resolution is now connected by each pair of you know, adjacent resolutions is connected by a little edge indicating the, the saddle move that we do to pass from one to the other. So for instance, this saddle move corresponding to this edge will split my green circle into a green and blue. This one, same thing. This, both these edges will then merge uh, blues and a green circle. So what I have to do is I have to tell you which objects in my DTL category I will assign to a picture of like this and which morphisms I want to assign to an edge like this. And that's going to build me my chain complex. So this is going to be the stuff in homological degree negative one. There are some of those two pieces will be in degree minus one. This will be my term in degree negative two. This will be my term in degree zero. My differential and objects are here. So I want. The in essential circles to contribute a tensor factor of this, uh, it's just a multiplicity of vector space. You should think of it as two copies of the trivial object, one with shift one and another one with shift negative one. And I'll think of it as an algebra. It's really a convenience algebra. So we'll think of it as the uh, algebra CX modulo x squared equals zero, but with a little shift. So like, so here I shifted so that x is in degree one and one is in degree negative one. And then my essential circles, each occurrence of an essential circle is gonna to contribute to the tensor factor of B. Okay. So, so my chain complex coming from this picture uh, is going to be V sitting in degree negative two. And then in a direct sum of stuff, I'll have A tensor B, direct sum A tensor B, maybe tilde, because I want to think of these as objects in DTL. Getting straight and right tell this. And then that's three essential circles. So it's going to be V to the sense of power of three. And my morphisms. So if I want to write down the morphisms uh, explicitly in terms of dotted temporal Lee diagrams, then I should tell you this is really two copies of V tilde. This is another two copies of V tilde. So let me let me write it as V tilde. And there's shifts. I'm sorry. I didn't write it in that picture because it would have been annoying. Uh, the shifts should have been um, two squared. I'll just write the shifts and we'll um, the shifts should have been q squared q to the zero. And because of the q inverse occurring here, what you end up with is the dust settles and you end up with this direct sum of four copies of E tilde. This one with shift one, this one with shift two squared, this one with shift one, this one with shift two squared. And then the cubed. Um, and uh, the maps here, Well, if I had infinite time, I, I would tell you I would associate to um, every single possibility. There's six of them. Uh, um, but let me 
just work out this example. So I want to think of the differential in the string complex is going to be some sequence of matrices. This will be a four by one matrix because it's going from one direct sum thing to four. And then the entries are a dot identity, negative a dot, negative the identity. Then minus sign is conventional just to make these square equal to zero. Again. Maps here are. Um, so, so let's think about this. So this will, um, this edge corresponds to a saddle coverism that merges these two guys. So one blue circle becomes two uh, green ones. So we're, we're going to do the identity on this internal V circle. And then we will do a cup on the other two green circles or a cup for the dots. But yeah, so this is my this is my differential at the end. I will have to wrap up. So the differential looks something like this. So maybe maybe this is a little bit too rushed, but um there is some procedure which will produce a, a chain complex. Two equivalent link diagrams will get into a chain, chain with their equivalent complexes. Um, so this procedure will define will define chain complex in HDL with sums and shifts and something in the joint, um, which depends only on the link represented by the diagram up to up to chain of the equivalence, possibly with an overall shift. And that shift can be normalized away. Um, okay, so this is the in some sense a standard story, but possibly not. And um, I think I better stop there. I didn't even look at my watch. Just see what time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm so what I would have said next, and but which I have, don't have time to say now, is that if you take the so this go, this third goal which was to, to explain um, how these special braids. Uh, behave like standard and co-standard objects in the highest weight structure, I would have told you what that meant, <laughs> but maybe not proved it. Um, so uh, there is a very explicit kind of simplification of these chain complexes. Um, and, and yeah, that's the sort of Newish, new, newest stuff is the computation of these complexes and the proof that they have the highest weight properties. So I'll stop there. Question. So this uh, I think H bar version of the character shapes of the important column. So we keep we set of functions before the fall we take the universe and get the functions of the action of the universe. Is there an analog of this detail for the action? So so I, I think you're asking me, is there a version of this category in which I do not specialize the parameter to minus one? Uh, no, no, so that would be another direction. So that would be the direction to the quantum like Q parameter. Right. So changing from group to quantum. Uh, and H bar is the most. And, and H, -bar H bar is this sort of response to the definition of functions. So we need to put. So does H bar correspond to? So there's a family. So I can also look at, I can also look at big, big SL2 equivariant cheese on little. But little it's not cheese. Yes. So, so what we look at big over and the the modules over over the universe and the function. Well, quantum there was some set from here. And, and this kind of uh, 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 deprivation of, of this, of this. Uh, 
Globalization. E, well, is there? So there are two ways that I know of to deform this picture, and one of them might be what you are just what you're referring to. Oh, so there are two ways of deforming this picture. One one way in which you can deform this picture is to consider sheaves on little g. So the equation a squared plus b squared plus, plus sorry the equation a squared plus bc uh, equals zero can be deformed. Uh, and and uh, now now we're looking at g equivariant sheaves not on the noble one but on all of little g. Yeah. So this is one way to uh, deform. There is a link homology theory corresponding to this kind of deformation. This is called equivariant. Like, um, there's some equivariant versions of Kavanaugh homology in which you don't set the dot squared equal to zero, but you set the dot squared equals to something like this. It's either it's epsilon times the dot or it's epsilon times the identity. I forget. I think maybe this one. So there's that kind of deformation, and there's a link homology theory associated to this as well. Story works the same way. There's another kind of deformation you might need, which is, which actually I learned about from Ben Elias. So um, there's like a hundred, you know, like there's a hundred different ways of describing Catalan numbers. Like this set is in bijection with this set is in bijection with this set is in bijection. Well, there's also a hundred different ways of describing these categories. So one equivalent way of describing these categories, which Ben Elias. Therefore, I also really like them. Uh, so there's another way of describing these categories, which is which is nice uh, in terms of singular, maximally singular zergal bimodules and affine type, whatever. So there's there's some zergal bimodulary way of, of arriving at these categories. So this is something I really like. So Rick Ben's given geometric and algebraic Sipake paper if you want to look at this. Uh, and the uh, affine part type matrix has a, has a cute information. Instead of putting tubes on the diagonal, you could put like quantum tubes on the diagonal, and you get a quantum parton matrix, and you get a you get a, uh, a deformation of this category that way. Maybe this is where your H bar comes from. So this is how I would turn on Q: is I would take Ben's quantum parton matrix and look at singular categories or the bimodules. For that, and then extract out all of the diagrammatics from this thing. Now, I'm not sure. I'm sorry that I've no, the, the possibly answer. answered a question you didn't ask, but maybe. You know, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, somehow, like, somehow, like, if you take Hopf algebra cohomology of the small quantum group, you're also supposed to get the no potent cone, which maybe is related to what you're. There's all kinds of things. Is really yeah. Everything is the same as there. Yeah, it's like I don't. That's it's awesome. I'm actually still kind of a newcomer to this uh, this way of thinking about things. So I, I mean, it's kind of the half and heck algebra, right? It's, it's yeah, but weird. it's not um, always thinking it. <laughs> it's affine, yes, but in a way that. Like there's a lot of circles, and I'm used to thinking about a slightly different circle. And this, sorry, I don't. Uh, um, you can wonder about SLN. You all should be asking why why SL two. What happens for SLN? Okay, so there's a link homology version that this is this is like work in progress. So I I can't say anything until we about it. But presumably, there's a nice diagrammatic description. Nothing special. This up here. Does this have anything to do with the, the construction of the affine heck algebra using like equivariant K theory? On um, I guess it'd be the Springer resolution, but yeah, it's, it's like a, yeah, I don't know. I'm just I was trying to think of like what's being like it. well so the category five besides the non stuff uh yeah. what's being categorified is that, is that yeah, 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 yeah 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 that's the spongy and 
mean, what's being categorized is, yeah, somehow this affine heck out of the wild root. Okay. Um, Maybe the center. Is it something that I, you know, extracted from some papers of Roman? Okay. Uh, and these categories that appear, what are they supposed to be? They're supposed to be like, um, Uh, I, I, yeah. Was your question again? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Read the introduction yeah. to the Roman space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's it's a nice yeah. Um when asked like, where's the sunburn? <laughs> yeah, the what would the two sides of this theorem look like or conjecture? So there, uh, so for SLN on the Nicomology side, the kind of category that governs these dudes is the category of SLN webs and phones. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some explicit construction of this category. Inside the annulus, you can Kind of calculate this thing explicitly, so it's got circles and dots. And... So anyway, so on, on the linkology side, this would be called the uh, horizontal trace of SLN webs and columns. And then on the representation theory side, it would just be the nil cone of SLN. Diagrammatically, what it looks like in terms of dots, dots and complete diagrams. Um, I think it would look very similar, but you would just have uh, web, you would have webs. Um, with that carry dots and some relations them. That Sorry, that's not hmm? does it have a name? I don't I don't think so yet. I mean I don't um I don't think it's been written down yet. This is like the working parts. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it does have a name. Uh, echo variant vector bundles on an upload cone. <laughs> um, Think Matt again? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>